Good morning everyone and welcome back to Art Portuguese Homestead. In today's video I want to give y'all an overview of all the food that we're growing here on our three hectare farm in central Portugal. This will be a, a whole picture of everything that we grow here on the farm. So that includes the vegetables as well as all the perennials, perennials that we have going as well as the chickens and the bees. So I want to show you all that and kind of run through all the things that we have done over the last few years to work on our self-reliance <laughs> instead of self-sufficiency. So I want to start here in our vegetable garden. This is on the lowest part of our property. Uh, we kind of have a, a little valley. This vegetable garden is all the way down in the valley right next to our well. So we have our main water source here. It's a well that is a couple meters wide and many meters deep. And as you can see, it has been going down over the last uh, few weeks. Because it, it's connected to the groundwater as well as that we've been pumping water out of it. Uh, this is where the water will usually be if it's completely full. Um, this is about halfway. So for now, we're good. Um, of course, water is always a struggle and a worry because this is all the water that we have uh, that's easily accessible to us. We have some new wells that we'll talk about in next week's video. So I had wanted to grow less vegetables this year just to keep it small. Um, I'm not planning on doing a lot of uh, preservation so not any canning or drying just because I don't have the time right now nor a good setup in the kitchen that I can really have things going as well as not take up all the space. So for the next, uh, for these few years that we're really getting started, it's all about learning how to grow the different things, um, what works well here and what doesn't. And so far we've learned, I've learned a couple of things. We do a traditional flood irrigation here in our garden, which um, does take a lot of water, but not more than uh, sprinklers or that kind of thing. The reason that we don't do any drip irrigation is because we only have the well water and we're in clay soil, so they get clogged up super quickly. Um, we do have it in other parts of the land, as you, as you will see later and have seen in previous videos. For the annuals, we decided that flood irrigation was the best way to go. And I'm really pleased with it because um, in combination with the soil that we've been amending over the last few years, the vegetables, or most of the vegetables, are really thriving now. I had wanted to do less tomatoes this year because last year I accidentally grew a lot and it was a lot of work to get it preserved. So I planted less plants, but they're giving more tomatoes. So I'm still giving away plenty to our neighbor. <laughs> Uh, but I have learned two very valuable lessons about the tomatoes that we have right or that I have growing this year. The lighting is a little bit funky, but we'll go with it. So, um, I just have this main row of tomatoes going and I have three different types in here. I have San Marzano, which is a basic um, Italian sauce tomato. Um, I have um, a French sounding one that I forget the name of, but I will put on the screen as well as some more Fiorentino tomatoes, uh, which are the same as we have in the greenhouse. I'm really loving these um, French tomatoes. They, I hope they're French. <laughs> they stay orange which I didn't realize when I planted them and so I was waiting for them to turn red but they don't um, but they're amazing I'm gonna grow them next year uh, as well I'm gonna save some seeds from these um, they don't really have the regular tartness of a tomato um, but they're very sweet and it's almost like you're eating fruit and yes tomato is a fruit so yeah this is um, one that is 
doing super well here in the conditions that we have. So that's good. The plants look very healthy. They don't need that much work and they're giving some of the biggest tomatoes that I've ever grown. So it's amazing. 10 out of 10 would recommend I'm doing that again next year. But something that I'm not doing next year is the San Marzano. They started out really well. They give a decent amount of fruit and the plants look very, kind of healthy. Um, but they got sunburned during the last heat wave as well as they don't like um, getting completely dried out, which is something that happens very easily here in the heat of central Portugal. Um, so they don't, um, when I do the flood irrigation on them, they um, they go dry and then they get water and they don't love that. And I know that because I have been having a lot of um, blossom end rot with them. Lots of people say that's a calcium deficiency, but from what I could, uh, gathered, it's mostly um, the problem is that the plant is not able to take it up uh, properly, the calcium from the soil, and that has to do with irregular watering. So for as we have the garden set up right now, it just, they don't work for me. I might try them again in a few years when um, we're growing in a different space, but for now, they're not worth it for me. In this year's garden, I really wanted to work on interplanting a lot more, kind of working towards a polyculture system, just to see how that would go here. And so far, I'm very pleased. Um, how I went about this is interplanting lots of things, kind of structured, kind of not. So in between the tomatoes, I planted beans. And the idea there was to attract different kinds of pollinators um, different kinds of bugs that would serve as predators for um, pests that might come up. I haven't really had an issue with pests this year at all, which is good. Might be because of the interplanting, might just be luck, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so I really made a conscious effort to put lots of things all together. So the tomatoes I did with the beans and then uh, the courgettes I did with a different kind of uh, climbing bean and I also placed lots of uh, different flowers in between as well as lots of sunflowers um, on the ends to for the look but also to attract bees uh, and we're gonna save the seeds from those uh, for the chickens I'm very pleased with how the courgettes are doing it's kind of hot for them so they're not producing as much as they did earlier in the season um, and some of the plants are kind of at their end uh, so that's why I wanted to make this video before we start ripping a couple things out and replacing them I wanted to show you everything that we have growing right now another thing that we're gonna rip out soon or I'm gonna rip out soon is the climbing beans uh, we had climbing runner green beans um, in Dutch we call them kousebant. I'm just not a fan of the flavor um, compared to the bush beans, the green beans that we have going as well. So I just decided let's take them out, let's try to um, grow something else here. So I planted or I seeded like a, a, a yellow romano bean that we're gonna replace this with. Um, and see how they go and hopefully we'll have some towards the end of the season. I did try to plant like a varied array of summer vegetables, so not just tomatoes but also um, peppers and courgettes. Some of the uh, padron pepper plants are doing very well, um, I'm very pleased with them, but I'm the only one who eats them, <laughs> so only a few plants is plenty. I did also plant some sweet peppers, but they're not doing much. One of the fruits that I was producing got sunburned completely, so I just ripped that off. And my eggplant wasn't doing anything for quite a few weeks. I'm not sure why, but that's just how it goes. It's just not a good eggplant season for me this year. Which is a shame because I do love them. This bed, we're just having um, a lay fallow for this season. We didn't 
amend anything in it and we wanted to keep these um, these leaks that had gone to seed uh, because I noticed that they were one of the best bug magnets that I have ever seen. So it was an array of bees and wasps and other types of bugs. Um, so they were really good for attracting pollinators earlier in the season. So I just let them go and uh, they looked very pretty. So that was also a plus. As you can see, my sunflowers, or at least these sunflowers are kind of done for now. In an upcoming video, I will share where we measured this and how tall it was. Uh, but for now, I'm just uh, letting them here to show you as well as we have lots of small birds who love to sit on the heads and I'm sure they also take some of the seeds um, so they're a good uh, bird magnet I suppose um, I'm planning to save these seeds and do a little trial because we have um, some of them are very tall but they have a smaller head some of them have a bigger head like a very big head they're not so tall and then some of them have like 15 different small heads so i want to do a little trial to see if those genetics uh, go over into the next generation or if that's just something that happens from any type of seed so that's an exciting trial and then underneath the sunflowers are some of the or some of the only squash that i managed to grow this year these are um gem squash um grown from seeds that one of you guys sent me so thank you so much for that because these are the only ones that i actually succeeded in um so we're excited to try these i think they could do better with better soil but i'm still happy with this result and that's mostly because i had to let my pumpkin pumpkin patch go you can't see anything here anymore because i let all the plants die during the heat wave the only pumpkin that i had going got sunburned and then i just thought these plants are not going to do anything they're not worth the water or the work so next year i'm just gonna start i'm already starting a compost heap here and i'm just gonna plant directly into that and then hopefully hopefully i can start producing some more pumpkins. One thing that was very important to us this uh, growing season is starting to work on our own um, calorie supply. So I'm really trying to focus more on calorie crops instead of just your annual vegetables because tomatoes are very nice but they're not going to keep you full for very long. So for the future and just for our own self-reliance self-sufficiency whatever you want to call it um i think it's important to start growing more um calorie dense crops carbs so this year i'm trying a, or i'm growing a few different things um behind me here is the sorghum which is a grain it's much much more resilient in the kind of um unpredictable climate that we have here in the region so it doesn't mind when it gets super hot um, it, it's okay not getting as much water um, as it might want being a little dry on the ground that kind of thing so it's really it's something that we grew last year and I really wanted to build up our seed bank when it comes to the sorghum and then before the harvest I also want to work uh, or I want to see if I can get a grain mill somewhere so that we can actually use it as a flower. It's not very tall yet because I planted it kind of late, but it doesn't need a super long growing season to make seeds. And um, so hopefully before before November, when we have the first frost, um, it will have produced um, some seed heads. In the next block here, we have sweet potatoes. Um, these are purple sweet potatoes because they came up the best for me and because we love the flavor. I'd been doubting whether I should try to grow sweet potatoes because we have clay soil here. And initially I had been reading that 
they don't love clay soil and then i also start but then i also started to hear the exact opposite of they don't mind it at all they love it um so i'm trying now this year to see how they go here some of them are doing good some of them not so much um we'll see in a couple months how the harvest is for them and then here in the final block i have amaranth going which is also a very heat and drought tolerant grain which comes from south america you can eat the leaves if you want to during summer i'm not super interested in any cooked greens but you could um, if you do have that <laughs> that urge so that's for all the annuals annuals are a lot of work and um, they can be kind of fickle so you're not always uh, guaranteed a harvest so something that we're also trying to work on is planting more perennials as you saw in january i will link that video here for you uh, we planted a berry patch and we planted it underneath some oak trees in the here in the lowest part of her land in the hopes that they would survive <laughs> because um, berries don't love the kind of heat that we have here in Portugal so they need shade and they need lots of water they're really doing much better now that we have the drip irrigation going because um, before the, I did water them but just like shallow hand watering is not ideal for them to make deep roots so now I water them once or twice a week with the drip irrigation for 20 minutes and, and they're doing very well. Some of them had already passed away, but my, my strategy or my philosophy is usually plant and then um, the things that survive, you can multiply them um, and then just not worry about whatever died because um, yeah, we're kind of working with extreme conditions. It can be hard to establish things. So some of the plants look kind of wonky. For example, the blueberries are, they don't, don't look super well, but this uh, summer is really about getting them established, giving them enough water to survive. And then I know that over the next couple of years, they will start to um, grow more and better and um, we will get some blueberries from them, hopefully. The final thing that I wanted to show you here on uh, the bottom terrace of our land is our greenhouse. I've had some questions about why do we even grow in a greenhouse and the major reason for doing that is season extension. So here in um, inland of Portugal, uh, we live in the Castelo Branco district. We do get cold nights for quite a while, so even in, into late April, it's not ideal to have your tomatoes already outside. So that's kind of a misconception that people have about Portugal. Uh, not, not everything is like on the coast, very warm and mild for most of the year. We have some extremes to work with and we have actual seasons to work with. So I wanted to get a greenhouse as a working growing space to see if that would be beneficial for us. And I did it kind of late due to circumstances planting in this greenhouse. I think I could have planted the tomatoes a couple weeks earlier, but I didn't get to it. So <laughs> that's how life goes sometimes. You might have seen they gave us a pretty good crop, um, especially for new beds and a first year of growing in this space. So for the purpose of season extension, I think a greenhouse is a really good space. Some of the things in here are not doing super well, like the peppers and the aubergines, but they're not doing well in the garden either. So I'm not sure 
what my struggle is with them this year but the tomatoes did really well we have some uh, courgettes plants that are still doing good we have some beets going all in all a pretty good growing space and um but this is only two meters tall so um the plants are done for now um they're not going to give us any more tomatoes because they don't they can't grow any taller um and it wasn't possible for me to kind of lead them that way or something like that it gets really very hot the frame because it's um a metal frame so the tops have started to burn and the plants are just kind of done they do they look healthy and fine so my plan for this um space now is to plant um some more green beans in here so that we can have them through the fall um as well as maybe a courgette or two extra and then oh, uh, throughout the winter these beds are kind of a learning space for me to see if um i can do a nitrogen fixing with um, peas in here as well as uh, fava beans kind of see how I, how, how I like that and hopefully get some peas and some beans from that to conclude it's not perfect but very pleased um, with the results so far Okay, next up, some fruit. Um, when we bought this property, we already had a couple established fruit trees and bushes. Um, there is one. Uh, there is one fig tree that was uh, very much engulfed in brambles and wasn't having a good time, basically on the brink of death. So we did prune it back very hard and it's kind of going back now. But because this summer has been extremely, extremely dry, um, our fig, fig tree, as, as many other fig trees here in the area, as from what I've seen, is very much struggling. So um, when it comes to growing zones, we're very much starting to push being to ab being able to grow figs because they do like a lot of water so uh, we might plant some on um, the new property that or the new piece of land that we have next to our land but for now um, yeah we might lose some but we're having a very good grape here at least this grapevine is doing very well so far um, there's like uh, two or three stems here it's a little bit overgrown though um, but we're having a very good grape crop from these this year so that's kind of might Ooh. stunning so, so, um, it's packed here so these might be for the javali they're kind of at the bottom and then over here we just have so many grapes it's really a very here's some more a very good year for grapes these are just like your regular eating table grapes they're this really nice pinkish color and they're absolutely delicious so I think in a couple of weeks, Puck will be about 50% grape because she loves them. Speaking of sugar, we often get the questions if we do any beekeeping or the statement that we should get some bees. Uh, we already have bees. We have, we have seven, eight hives going right now. Mostly caught swarms from our neighbor who said we could catch his swarms this is our second season beekeeping and we're learning lots we have iberian bees which are um, a more defensive kind of bee so the bee suit is very much essential uh, they're they're very um depending on the colony of course they can be um very defensive and they don't make the large amounts of honey that other types of bee do. 
but the Iberian bee is, has been here for hundreds and hundreds of years, so they're very well adapted to our climate and um, yeah, that's the reason why we keep them. The harvest will be in a couple weeks, uh, we'll have to see how many kilos we get from them. Uh, we do. We don't like to take too much honey from them because it's still the middle of summer and um, we try to do a little bit more of a mix of conventional beekeeping combined with some more natural beekeeping just so we're still kind of figuring out which method um, suits us best because there are a thousand ways to do beekeeping and you just have to do uh, what's right for you in that capacity. The other animal that we keep for food are chickens. Uh, we're down to three chickens because we're slowly phasing them out. Um, right, We keep the chickens mostly for the eggs and we just have those standard brown chickens um, that produce a lot of eggs but they all, to produce that amount of eggs they also need um, store-bought like power food with extra protein and that kind of stuff. We want to kind of, they're good starter chickens, but we want to kind of go away from that and go to a more natural type of chicken um, so that we can also um, have broody hens and produce our own chickens and um, maybe have more chickens, but uh, that they can forage and eat from the compost more. And so that we have a little bit more control over that aspect of our food production. Um, this is a coop that Martin built a couple of years ago from pallets. It's very heavy and we have to move it again uh, because we love moving around our chickens. <laughs> they have this enclosure so that we can lock them up if we need to. Um, but they also uh, forage around the property uh, for bugs and things. So yeah, we kind of do a mixed system for them. Okay, so this is a little bit random, but one of the things that we are completely self-sufficient in, and which I'm really proud of, is oregano. And that's because the most amazing wild oregano grows here. I think it grows all over the Mediterranean, but it grows very well on our land here. Over here you can see the remnants of the wild oregano. We let them go to seed because we noticed that the bees love them. So this is a very good wildflower for them to have. I pick about a year's worth of wild oregano and I dry that um, and it's amazing. So it's, it's like nothing you'll ever taste from store-bought oregano. I love it. As I said in the beginning, our property is about three hectares in size and about one hectare of that is olive field. We have about, we have more than a hundred olive trees here on the land and some of them are doing very well, some of them are very much still recovering from um, the years that they didn't get pruned and that kind of thing. Olives are very much part of our long-term plan uh, using trees and perennials to provide us with quality food. Um, olive trees we keep um, for the eating olives. We have cordoville olives, which are big green olives that we um, put into brine, as you might have seen in our olive picking video. And then we have small black olives, which are na native to this region and that produce olive oil, which brings me to an announcement that you might have already heard in the live stream that we did recently, but we, ha we are starting to sell our own olive oil under the brand name Ortavelia, which is um, the name of our farm, actually. It means old garden. It's honestly some of the best olive oil you will ever taste. Uh, it's all picked by us um, 
here and on uh, the property of friends and um, pressed at a local olive press and so we really want to share that beautiful product with you you can find a link to our website in the description box down below if you would like to order some because of uh, paperwork and the small batch that we have right now we only ship within the eu um, and then next year hopefully we uh, can expand on that um, but for now if you would like some olive oil and you are within the eu you can go buy that <laughs> beautiful product so um but obviously olives are a beautiful tree um, they grow really well here they don't really need watering um, they can be hundreds if not thousands of years old and so that's really part of our long-term plan here is to have access to that oil olive oil because it's good for you it's healthy and it's a fat which is something that a lot of um, that is often forgotten within setting up your self-sufficiency plan so we're just really grateful that we have access to such a awesome tree <laughs> Okay, we are on the terrace in between our kitchen terrace and our garden terrace. As you might have seen a couple of weeks, if not months ago, uh, we laid down the drip line here. And that was very necessary because the fruit trees that we had planted here a couple of years ago, the first winter that we were here in 2019 <laughs> um, they were very much surviving and not thriving we had been watering them with uh, just watering cans so by hand every other day um, but because the ground gets so hard during summer because of the heat um, really most of that was just kind of flowing away and not going uh, to the tree so we laid down this drip irrigation and I'm already seeing a difference in how well the, the trees are doing. So that was a very necessary thing to do. Here you can grow lots of things, but the most important thing to keep in mind is that they really do need to be watered. So within permaculture, I often see this idea of you can plant anything, it's gonna be amazing. Just put it in a swale, which is a topic for another video and it'll be fine but because it doesn't rain here for months on end during summer things really need to be irrigated well and um, from what we've learned over the last few years to get fruit trees established drip irrigation is very much needed and hopefully over the years they will need less water as they develop deeper roots and that kind of thing but the first couple of years they need to be watered pretty frequently so um, you shouldn't plant too many trees if you're just starting out we planted maybe 25 to 30 uh, trees with the same kind of mindset of just seeing what wants to grow here uh, what just what doesn't want to die straight away and then we do more of that so we've noticed that apples do quite well for us still luckily um, as well as pears so we have some apple and pear trees that do really well some uh, the asian pear is already giving some fruit but we also have the more traditional uh, tree that you might expect here like a pomegranate and an orange a nespereira which is a loqua tree um, all sorts of things and hopefully now that we have the irrigation set up properly we will have some fruit in the next couple of years Wow, if you're still here, <laughs> I hope you are uh, learning something, enjoying what I have to show you. We are at our final source for food that we are growing here on our land for the long term. And that is something that is not really usual, but I think will be a great resource it's already a great resource. It used to be very important for many people and I think it will become that 
in the future again and that is oak trees so we have right now we have two types of uh, oak trees here on the land cork oak which you can obviously also use for the cork uh, and hopefully we will get them peeled again next year and we also have home oak um, both type of trees give acorns and acorns are food they are a little bit of work to process because you have to leach out the tannins i did do a video on that um last winter because um i really wanted to start get uh, experimenting with how i can use acorns and how like slowly learning how to process them but i think i really really think that they are they will be an, a very important part of our diet in the future because they just grow here. Um, oak trees just come up everywhere here from the acorns that fall down from them. They go really well because they make a really deep tap root. And acorns are very nutritious. So they have proteins, they have fats, um, and uh, you can eat them. So they're not just for the pigs, they are also for us. Uh, acorns are just such a great resource so um and they grow anywhere there are so many types of oaks uh, some uh, that give acorns that you can eat in uh, some capacity so i would recommend that you research them a little bit and see what you can maybe forage in your area because it's food that's readily accessible but no one eats anymore so um that's everything we're growing on our property because we're learning all these new skills we have young children um, we have many things to do right now all of them we do on a small scale so we do trial batches like with the grades in the garden we do trial batches with acorns see how they process we're all trying to pick up these skills for the future um, combining annuals as well as perennials um, hopefully moving to a larger part perennials and we also obviously of course keep some animals right now but we don't want to commit to pigs or goats or what have you because uh, they are a lot of work and we just don't have the capacity right now so that's all for the future lots of things to come but i'm very happy with the kind of skills that we have built up so far to uh, feed ourselves now and in the future i hope this was a little bit informative and um yeah i hope to see you next week